All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Mark Yednick uh, from Zebra Technologies. As my coworker Ford, um, and we also have our uh, my colleague Sergey, who's been instrumental in our framework and our development uh, at Zebra. Um, a brief history of kind of where we are at and what we're going to cover today is a little bit of a background and history of our problem set and where we started and how we got to where we are today. Um, why do we use messaging? Um, because we're going to be talking about a messaging uh, construct and framework that we use within our larger application framework. Um, we're basing it on a network queue. Uh, so messages are queued, however, our underlying transport is a TCP connection. Um, so we can actually cross application boundaries, machine boundaries, uh, it's a lot of flexibility. Um, and in order to our messaging system to work, it's based on a publish uh, subscribe model. Uh, we do have a message router and a broker, um, and then routes defined within our system um, that are dynamic. Uh, then the things can, you know, publish uh, what they're sending. Um, also subscribe to messages to receive it, and our broker broadcasts those throughout the system. Um, we have some various message classes to kind of generalize our communication. Uh, we also our messaging is um, not lab view centric because we actually can communicate with all uh, languages and applications outside of the LabVIEW domain. Um, and then we'll just talk about some of the benefits and pitfalls of this type of a messaging system. So our environment's a little bit unique. You know, most people here are testing hardware. Uh, Zebra makes barcode and labeling printers and barcode scanners and things like that. What we actually do is we test the printer firmware. So we're automating our printing tests uh, of the, the application and the firmware running on the printer itself. We don't really do any hardware testing, uh, at least not within our group. We have about 115 different printer types that we have to support. We have about 17 different print languages that we have to support. So our test suite covers all of those different languages. Um, a thousand plus printer settings that we also have to test and five different interfaces to the, to the printers. Um, so we have a kind of complex situation. One complete execution on a, on a single printer is about 3,800 test cases, some 31,000 plus test steps, and over 250,000 test points that we have. So it's, it's a fairly large, complex system that we're working with. We used to... The tests also include semi-automated tests, so we do have user interaction, so we have kind of a robust UI interface as well, um, so it's not kind of like end-of-line testing, push the thing, you know, push the button, wait for red or green, and, and move on. We do have interaction with our users um, on some, some test cases. Um, and the firmware, as anyone would know, is constantly changing. Um, so it's a very dynamic test environment that we're continually updating, uh, adding new tests, adding new you know, printer types. One of the reasons we have 17 printer languages is that we kind of emulate customers so we can steal their business. Um, and so as new customers come, or new competitors come in, we then emulate their printer languages and we have to then roll that into our system as well. Where we started out, actually this is a precursor. When I started at Zebra 14 years ago, they had a homespun automated test system that was developed by an intern who then was gone and the source God knows where it went, um, and nothing was managed. The test case management was basically the files on somebody's PC, and one of the complaints they had, they'd run tests, and they'd get different results, even for the same test, because that tool had an automatic update of the expected results. Push one button, and it would save all your new expected results. So if you had a bad test run, um, you just updated and said, now that's gonna be your test going forward. So we started many years ago with a solution to replace that, which was in Testan. Um, and that started to get, our original solution started to get a little unruly because of the number of uh, test cases that we had. We were approaching, I think, 1,200 test sequences uh, in Testan, and that just became unmanageable. So we started to move into a database model and this was our ZCAT, what we call ZCAT, Zebra Automated, or Comprehensive Automated Test. Um, the original one was 
uh, version one was all test and two through five um, was a combination of test and lab view and our latest incarnation which we're at today is a 100% lab view solution um, we've <coughs> taken basically all of our test cases they test data and um, everything dumped into a database because obviously for doing you know hundreds of thousands of tests it's hard to store that on the file system very easily and manage it especially across various product types um, and our system also has version history of the <coughs> tests so once the test changes we can still go back and run the old test from the database so we're not going to dive too deeply into our um, application we'll just show you a little bit of what it is um, it's built on top of our framework um, Load the screen. No, it's on this one. Projector's still good. Nice. Projector's yeah. showing the light. Oh, wiggle it. It was having issues earlier. Just the the, the one adapter on the computer and the printer in the computer. Oh, on the computer, wiggle your adapter. If it gets bumped, it sometimes. Bump so we just have to the connection. Well, this one's not the one we're using. It's the. So this is the live system um, built on top of our framework. One of the nice things about it is, as people have been hearing in earlier presentations, um, most of what you see on the screen is all subpanels. It's all dynamically loaded based on what you're doing. Um, and because of that, we have a very highly parallelized system um, with task running, and that kind of necessi necessitates our having messaging between them. Um, it's not actually the actor framework but it's essentially actors running in our system. And our users got very used to sort of the test and look, which is we kind of replicated the output for some of the pass fail and the execution. So this is all done in that? That's 100% lab view. Press it. Right, because you can't do modern monkey interfaces in lab view, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the reasons I want to show this because you know, it doesn't look like it's lab view. Yeah. So we're trying our best to make our application like a Windows application. It looks really good, guys. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So, so that's a favorite test. And some user interactions. Yeah, it, it, these are all loadable sub-panels, so different test steps that we have can all basically load in their own content. Um, so different things. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, to demonstrate uh, microprocesses, um, with one of microphone. Microphone. Nope. Sorry. Right. So to debugging one of, uh, to demonstrate one of the um, features that we're having for independent uh, processes that are running individually, here is a test measure to help debugging. And then on the left side, you can see the system hierarchies. So all of the tasks you see on the front panel, there are actually um, parallel processes that applies with the uh, MVC models that uh, run individually to each other. And they don't pass around the queue references forever. And they have their own uh, queue message handlers. So, you know, we're not going to dive completely into our. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> not going to dive completely into the whole application. Um, we're really just going to focus on our messaging system. Um, our actual application is set up where other applications outside of LabVIEW that can be written in C, that can be web applications, whatever, can actually communicate into our system. Um, the database is our back end with all our test case management. Um, our ZCAP Plus, because it's a new version, actually is comprised of the GUI and various elements and an entire execution engine then that does the data exchange via the messages and the, the, the database for the data, 
but then it's a series of plugins. And all those plugins are dynamically loaded, um, set up, and we needed a way to have all those kind of interact with each other and uh, dynamically be able to, to execute. So one of the things is that uh, we did make extensive use of PPLs. We've got, actually the slide is wrong because we already added a couple this week. Um, we've got 64 core libraries that make up our, our overall system. There's about 63 plugins. And then, I, is it application or plugins that you added? Uh, core libraries. Core libraries, okay. So now we got a higher number of core libraries. Um, and then we have some application specific PPLs. <coughs> um, if you have any questions on PPLs, we've gone through a lot of pain of using them. So feel free to ask. Um, the application framework relies on uh, lots of independent processes and it's almost entirely object oriented and highly modular um, and hence the 64 reusable libraries the you know so why do we need network messaging initially this started out when we did our first kind of move into the zcat uh, our version one and created our user interface in LabVIEW and uh, tested, uh, test stand was running. Um, once you deployed that system, it was running in different application spaces and they couldn't really communicate with each other. So we needed a way, and we also needed bi-directional communication or somewhat bi-directional because test stand would have callbacks, but that didn't give us the functionality we needed. And obviously our first choice was to use just regular LabVIEW queues. Um, they're great for messaging. Uh, we've, been, we've deployed it, we were working in our development environment, everything worked perfect. We installed our application and nothing worked. And found out, like I said, we couldn't cross the process boundaries. So we tried to look for a solution that would cover that and came up with a network queue. Um, and it, the network messages then basically allow us to cross those boundaries. And an extension of that then was we created a message broker because we didn't want to have everybody in our system knowing about everybody else. Um, because that's kind of, you, you know, a lot of highly coupled systems, hard to maintain, hard to extend. Um, so we basically created um, the messaging broker. And in, it, in that basically is a network queue, is our kind of primary backbone. Um, we have a routing service, which is basically consists of a message broker, uh, our publish subscribe kind of interface and uh, registration of processes. We have a kind of a defined messaging API. Um, we actually defined it in a, like I said, a, a language agnostic manner so that we can tap in with other applications. Um, and then we have messaging classes that we use internally that allow our components to basically, you know, plug and play and work very nicely. So, we're not going to dive too deep into this. If you look at our, our network queue palette, um, it's pretty much the same as the LabVIEW queue palette. The only one we're missing right now is, I think, uh, uh, Lossy queue. We didn't have that implemented. The biggest difference between this and a standard LabVIEW queue is that when you create it, you, we do have a client and a server um, when you create it. And the only real instance or, or, or requirement is that the server must be started first in your system. The server does not necessarily mean that's the dequeuer. Um, it just has to be started first and then clients connect into that and um, and like any other queue you should only have one dequeuer, multiple end queuers. Um, functionally it works exactly like any other queue. Um, just <laughs> send it in the network. I think we got a, a really small demo of that. It's uh, pretty basic on this one. So I'm not sure what the resolution changes. And it's still on. Nope. So with this then, so with this demo, we had also by using using the uh, PPLs we had for the core libraries, because all of our code has been converted into PPLs, and um, as part of that, we are demoing based on PPLs.
So here's one that is the server queue, which I just put it together very simply as the queue message handler. And then we have another client queue. It's also very simple, just send a message. So what it does is that when we start a queue, server queue, we can send messages to ourselves. Or if we start a client queue, we can also send message to the, uh, to the same queue of uh, the queue. And then if we just open up the client real quick, the, or the server and the client queue itself, the bot diagram, no, actually the, the queue. Yeah, but this is in the same address space, right? This is, this is, but it will cross boundaries. Because as you, as you see here, the server queue is actually setting up a TCP connection. Yeah. Um, it does utilize the NI name services location. So internally in the application, you can connect by name if you're within a LabVIEW space. Um, if you are outside of LabVIEW, you need to know the, the port number that we're on. Oh, so it's the port number. It's not the URL to the queue. No. It's right, so, so if you uh, create a server queue, uh, you have the port number. And then when you cl uh, create a client queue on another PC, you, you need to specify the target, which is here, the server address. address. And then uh -huh. uh, okay. yeah, it'll, it'll connect to it. It is then yeah. connect to the TCP IP. Yeah, it's straight TCP IP. And also, internally, if you don't supply an address, it goes to local address or local host. <coughs> so if you are on the same machine, you don't have to worry about you know having that information either. And then the um, connection handler. So do you have the connection handler? Yeah, you'd have to go into the queue support. Um, actually, what happens is when you do connect to the server, it'll spawn off a separate process for that individual client queue, queue coming in. It'll just do that for as many as you have connecting into your queue. Mm -hmm. So that's the same calling method from Active Framework. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was noticing that you have the same comment. <laughs> oh. <laughs> No, that's, yeah. that's great. If there's something in there that you guys can use, by all means. Yeah. That's, that's why the, that's why the <coughs> kind of up. Yeah. And so this, underneath the, the, the TCP layer here, it's a very simple protocol that these queues talk to each other to send the messages up and back. You know, and, and its messages are NQ, DQ, you know, CQ status, flush queue, whatever. Um, on the server side, there is a actual LabVIEW queue sitting there. So messages are contained in there, and then when the client connects or DQs or NQs, it then transfers it over the TCP connection. So moving on, this is like I said, you know, I don't want to dive too much into the queue because everybody knows what those are. Um, but as we start moving up into our, our system, we have some basic messaging class and some helper VIs that are for formatting and, and building and you know unformatting the messages. But we have kind of a, an envelope system. At the base level, the network queue just uses a type and a data. And the data is a string. Um, and we use a flattened string because like I said earlier, we can connect with other languages into this. Um, if it was a lab you type like a variant or something, you know, try describing that to somebody in Python or C of how to decode that. Um, and then underneath that, we have a basic message type within our system, which is a little more useful because it actually has a timestamp associated <coughs> with it. We have stealing from syslog, because one of the reasons it started was for some logging purposes. We have a message level. We know the source of the message. And then its data, again, is flat <coughs> string at that level. So at the queue, at our network queue layer, and our, our message router, it's only looking about looking at that 
on the routing. It doesn't care about any of the contents of the message. Um, it's the two end points that start to then actually have a more defined message format. So our message router then is a central, central uh, broker for the messages that incoming messages will come in and as items or processes subscribe by name, it's messages by name, it will then broadcast that message to any listeners out there. So it's a nice way that we can kind of extend our system because once any process comes into the system and registers to or subscribes for a message, we now then have another actor that can receive that message. And we just can pile up as many as we want and it can broadcast. Um, we also use regular expressions, which is very helpful. Um, we'll show you a little bit later on. We have a message debugger application that can tie into our system and we can see all our messages going up from, through the system. And it does that by registering for stock. So it says every message. And anything that doesn't have a listener, it just basically gets discarded. Um, we have some process registration messages that a process will basically advertise what messages it, it listens to or it can receive. Um, we actually were going to probably add one for what messages it will generate as well. And then you have subscription messages which just say I want to listen to this message or that message. And this also is nice decoupling because none of the systems have to know about each other. All they have to know are what messages they want to receive. Our messaging routing system is pretty simple. We just have basically four BIs, which is to create, to start, create and destroy, start the uh, server and stop the server. The other thing we've done is we actually have, on the start, we can start up multiple message servers. So if you start to have a bottleneck in the system, you know, everything funneling through one process, you can start to segment your messages out across different uh, brokers, and you can have a high priority message broker, or a low priority, uh, I don't really don't care too much about these messages, <laughs> you know, how quickly they get processed. Um, and it's nice, it's scalable that way. The other uh, internal utility VIs that are there just is, is my, my message router valid or not? Give them a name. Um, you can find out all of the routes that are defined in them, or all the message routing servers that are running, and then you can also get your server ports. That's the one, you know, because if we can actually say which port we want to do, but generally we just let the system assign a port randomly. Uh, whose responsibility is to assign priority to a message? That would be the, the application layer. The, so the, the application route. developer hard codes on the call side was the message priority. They they can't um, if you have a single message router, there is no priority. Oh, okay. Um, not yet. We were also talking about creating another priority queue within that where you could specify the message. But if you <coughs> had a, you could spin up two message servers and one could be a high priority, the other can be a lower priority. Okay. Um, segment it out. And then you need to publish twice, right? Yeah. And then our routing, um, we, we need inter internally to the routing server, it needs to maintain uh, who's, you know, who's registered, who's not. And we just have a simple routing class um, that actually kind of goes through you find out for a given message when it received, when our routing server receives it, finds out who's registered. Um, we'll then broadcast it. We obviously add delete routes, um, search routes, and we have different ways of adding and deleting and updating routes based on information that you provide uh, by name, by the type, different things like that. <coughs> and then the routing server demo. This is how you start a routing server. It's basically all it's needed. Somewhere in the very beginning of your code, you create a, a, the base routing server, you start a routing server, and you can start multiple, um, and then at the end of your code, you just basically stop it. This is exactly the same code as just shown in the, in the PowerPoint. 
just I just run it. It'll give me the the run service name, which is um, very important for later use. Because we allow coexisting applications on a on a single PC, the we inject the process number, process ID into it because then we don't have a single message router for everybody on the computer. The applications can spin up their own and they'd be unique. So we certainly don't want to create a bottleneck where we have five applications running and everybody's going through one broker. And moving on, One of the things that's you know necessary, um, especially if you have external applications, they we need to register our processes with our server, um, and basically that will tell the routing server what messages uh, that this process is capable of receiving. And again, it's a fairly straightforward, um, small class, not a lot to it. Under the hood, it's all variable or variant attribute list for the lookup tables. And on the opposite side then, uh, we have the subscription, which is, and what we do in our application is we kind of handle, when you create a subscription service, then your, your various methods here, we don't have to wire everything down. Um, we were trying to limit having to pass wires through the system, so any, the application startup, you'll create your registration and subscription services, and internally, the processes just need to call the register or unregister uh, methods, and the, you know that class is basically a singleton, but so we don't have to pass the wires throughout the system because it's a fundamental building block. We don't have connector pain with you know 19 million infrastructure things coming into it, and then the API actually for it is you can get registration records, you can get all the routes, or you can get any processes. You can look, get a list of processes with a given message that has a given message. Um, now, we have a, a, a very basic class, which is a, um, we use to actually post the messages. Again, a wireless interface. Um, you have an initialization in the beginning of your task, um, that's your application startup, your launcher, and then subcomponents, all they really need to do is call a post message um, method. And so again, we don't have to pass wires through. Um, it's a polymorphic, which gives you your message level, which goes back to our syslog. Um, that's mainly for logging purposes. It's not a, it is not used by the messaging system itself, um, but you can basically tag messages to have different levels so you can turn filtering on in your logging um, if you need to. And I think we have a little demo of kind of these pieces put together. So, um, so they're uh, falling into two parts again. So uh, one is the message listener um, that has the service network queue I just showed plus the subscriptions. So uh, for the routing server, routes and um, registrations are internal to the um, routing server that developers don't have to create most of the time. That the routing server, when you spawn it, it will be taken care of. So what you need to do is most likely just create a, a routing, uh, the server network queue, and then also subscribe it to the routing uh, server. And then the next thing is the message sender. So what you need to do again is just initialize yourself and post the message and destroy it at the end of the um, application. And one of the things we do in our utility classes, um, you did. I did say we kind of were like a wireless interface. Um, there was a wire running into our post message. Um, in our actual like core library classes, we just create a wrapper around this that takes care of that aspect of it. So we don't have to run wires through everything.
So um, this is the uh, block diagram of the uh, message listener. Uh, on the left, you see on the top here we create a subscription and we create the uh, um, create network so a uh, server queue and we we'll give it a name. So um, the next step is to just register whatever message you're gonna listen to or you want to receive. Uh, because it's um, accepting the uh, um, regular expression, so sometimes we want to make it accurate, which we apply the start and ending here. So that's what we call message filters. And then the next thing is just to run into the message handler and, and wait for the message that's being sent into the server. And on the other hand, the message sender you see that we just initialize um, the post event and then we just send it as we require to. So let me run this. So uh, basically, if, if you don't put any, um, so basically it's, it will send message to itself just like a regular queue. So what it does is we send hi, it's going to send it to itself because this is a private message. It just directly goes through the uh, the queue message uh, routes, so it does not go up to the routing server. But if we want to go across boundaries or from another processes that does not know your queue reference, and we need the queue message handler, uh, send sender. So there he um, is. Here we go. So it's wireless. Mm -hmm. And to help our code a little bit better is kind of the next layer, layer that we built upon it, what you saw there were all the kind of com component pieces of our system, but at a higher level abstraction, we have what we call our system messages. That kind of takes all of those core pieces, bundles them up, puts them together, and then this is what we've used basically in our applications at this layer. Um, the decode just gets you the base, our raw message format, it does not, know about the specific data type that you are sending in the data and uh, content, that's up to the, the receiver of the message to understand that. It, he needs to know the content of this message name is of this type. Um, but this gets you basically to that level where you can then typecast it or um, you know put it into the to specific message format. And sending messages, is we just call them system triggers, um, we kind of got the name trigger from Norm's TLB, which is another thing that we've kind of used inside our framework. Um, so that's kind of where that name came from. But that just takes care of all of the wrapping up of the subcomponents to, to make the messaging system work. It also has some intelligence because not everything has to go through the message router. Um, if you're sending what yourself messages, local messages, we have a naming convention that basically will allow you to either send to your own queue or go back, go out to the message router. Um, and it's done strictly by naming convention. So we have global messages which go through the message router. We have, you can also have a destination specific message. So you can have point to point messages and you can have your local message which just goes bas basically to yourself. And because we can tap into our message server from anywhere and from any application, we've actually built a debugger that allows us to tap into our messaging system. Um, so this kind of helps you as you know, asynchronous events can be hard to debug. You don't know what's going through the system, you know, which messages were sent, received. This actually allows us to see all of the messages that are there. Um, in the live demo, we can show you when you actually double click on a message, where you can see the message contents. It's the raw 
binary of it or the raw message because this doesn't know what the message types look like, but you can at least inspect it and see what's in your message. And then the last part of our demo is just kind of put all the pieces together and then you can see sort of how it, it works with itself. We have a couple different tasks. I'll let you explain that answer that side of it. Right, so um, as you can see here, uh, we have system task A and system task B, just to simulate they're in two different groups. Um, because I just simply put code together and hard code like different groups. And um, the main difference between this system task and the uh, um, message um, with listener is that I'm using the uh, system message here, which creates the, uh, the references, and then um, we have these translate messages to translate whatever uh, message type we wants to receive, and that ties to an enum. So in the system, you just define everything into this enum, and our system will automatically pick it up and convert it into the message you want to listen to with uh, the destination uh, unique ID, which um, most likely is the route name. And the rest part is most likely the same. So, um, let me start on service. Oops. Oh, just show the service. It's just some code that calling different components from uh, the previous demos. So if we launch the running server, you can see the server name here, which is um, created. And then uh, if we launch task A, we got a clone of task A, uh, a task from group A, and we launch it again, another task from group A. Let's spawn another two tasks from group B as well. So in this case, we can send message to yourself, which um, needs some um, naming convention that we put up that to specify this is the message you want to send it to yourself. So when we send it, you, you will see that only the task that sends it will receive it because this is a local message. It does not go up to the routing server. And say broadcast so if we really want to send some message to everyone that uh, sub subscribed so we just send um, hello all everyone will receive it with the same timestamp and let's say um, well I'll only say hello group member A or to another group group B so I just need to type in the, uh, or pass in the group name as the destination unique ID and send it to there. And you can see, uh, these two tasks are from group A, they didn't receive it, but the other two tasks from group B received it. So just, just checking my own understanding, uh, all that's handled, the routing, the routing server handles that. So yes. any, system, any system has a routing server and if you send a message out, it's going to use those various fields to decide which of its subscribers to go to. Yes. And when you launch one of these guys, it subscribes to the routing service. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that supports many to many, many publishers to many subscribers on the same topic. Yes. Is there a way to simplify that so that you don't need a router? Like a rerouting service? And what's that? We haven't really come up with a, a way to do that. Um, the benefit of the routing server is the broadcast capability of your messaging. Yes. yes. <coughs> you know, if you get rid of that, now you're tracking, somebody else has got to track all of the components and you start getting into coupling and you know, yes. passing each other's queue references around and things like that. We're trying to avoid that. 
can you spin off uh, publishing loops for individual topics so that the router doesn't become the bottleneck? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you do it in parallel when you need it. Yes. And it actually, we did that in our application. We ran into a bottleneck because, for simplicity's sake, we had just started one routing server. And you saw the earlier demo of our complete application. And for debug purposes, we turned on our logging. And all of a sudden, our system kind of came to a crawl because it was generating so many log messages, it was slowing down the application messages. So we just said, OK, logging messages will go to its own routing server because they're low priority. We don't care if they're you know, handled immediately, but we don't want to slow down our, you know, system messages. Mm -hmm. So we spun off a second server then and broke it out that way. And we also have, we also, in our um, messaging construct, we also start off another server that is strictly a Boolean type status information. Um, because we, less message there, it's a very small message and that handles just like status information, um, status flags. So you have, so if you have multiple routing servers, you have the option to register for one or more. Can you show me where you're doing that? Um, I missed it. Go up to where we start a message server. Okay. So once you create the routing class, <coughs> as many starts as you put down or as many servers as you put in. And then you have the option and, and then there's a it's, it's, you do multiple subscriptions. Yeah. If somebody wants to be attached to multiple servers and multiple subscriptions. Yes. Okay. Which is why you have, you have your own so so if any so if somebody coming into your framework writing in the module just has to and, and just check my understanding, I know you went over this. Starts up his own his own network queue that he'll receive messages on and then whatever subscriptions he wants. Yes. Okay. And then this is the, the debugger that we have. Um, I guess we don't have a lot of messages in our system right now. <laughs> this was this from the demo. But you can see here that as we messages would come through the system, you would you know see your list of messages. You can double click on it and you'll see the the guts of the message. Um, it's not going to be fully decoded. If it's a, if it's a big binary message, you basically can see your the hex code of it. Um, but it, it does allow you to tap in so you can find out if things aren't working. Um, you can look and see, am I getting the messages? Are they the right content? Um, and this is a separate standalone application. Um, we just install this and we run it against our applications. And all we need to know is which routing server we want to connect to. And we do that by name. <coughs> Um, and then you can also in investigate or uh, interrogate the routes that are defining the system and which processes are, are currently subscribed to the routing server. It's, it's proven to be a very useful tool. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, right, you don't have the, have the static connections. Let's say after grammar pass, you have just someone putting that who's going to what. Yeah. Mapping your component to mapping your network your message network. Yeah. yeah. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that's you know, okay, this is a obviously this is from our earlier demo. You can see there's a lot more messages in the system. Um, and this is a little bit of our naming convention. We get process names, um, the, the level that they're at, you get the service route uh, information there. And we handle most of that dynamically. Um, so when you just create the classes, we do a lot of this name generation for you and um, so you don't have to understand all of that. And this is kind of how we can do our group messages and directed messages and different things like that. Um, in the framework, we actually have, um, as it spins up tasks, it creates the groups for that, you know, we have other classes that, you know, for our framework that would take care of all this naming of the subprocesses and grouping of tasks and, and how you can, you know, get information to just a group of tasks or global.
So obviously benefits of this is that we cross platform and application boundaries and machine boundaries. Um, it's because of the way we define our messages, it is interoperable with other languages. Um, now, if we knew something was totally in within LabVIEW, we could basically send classes through by value, but obviously that wouldn't be able to be used outside of this. But other message content that we want to share or have from the external sources we can, um, it's very easy to extend because all we have to do is you know, start up a process, create a task, register for, to receive some messages, and you're in the system now. So it's e very easy to pull out that way. Um, and the modules really don't, the individual modules of the system don't need to know about each other. There's, it's very loosely coupled. Um, you just need to know what messages you want to receive. Um, and you know, we basically publish what our message API is or what you know, pieces are, uh, what messages different components it create. You just need to know which ones you want to listen to and you're good. Some of the challenges, um, challenging to debug. Uh, that's basically true of any highly asynchronous messaging system. Um, we do have our debugger which helps, but obviously when you're broadcasting messages and everything's asynchronous and it can be a little challenging to, to debug. Um, nobody's, nobody's, ever com no, no, nobody's ever complained of difficulties in say debugging after framework systems either. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that's just a fact of life with asynchronous systems. Yeah. One issue that we do kind of run into is firewalls and IT departments. Um, that can be a challenge. Um, and then the central, the central message router can become a bottleneck. But we do allow you to spin up multiple um, so that you can start to segment your messages if you do start to see bottlenecks within the system. Uh, but they would still use the same uh, TCP IP port, right? No, each one would use its own port. Oh, okay. Each one is its own mini server and its own port. No, no, I don't mean the server. If you have multiple parallel publishers inside the server, uh, still to send a message to a server, you need to use a single port. For that server, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes. I have a comment on that. I suspect that the port is not the bottleneck itself. It's the re regular expression that that you're that you're doing in series probably with that for well, we messages and two. We actually one. haven't found, I don't know what our message count is or what our throughput, I don't think we've measured the throughput, but it wasn't until we turned on all active logging in the system that we got a problem. And that was just generating literally thousands of messages a second. Mm -hmm. So under normal, no, under, under normal yes. circumstances, we have not really seen bottlenecks. I, I've developed a, a very similar system in Actor Framework and, and I reached you know, hundreds of thousands of messages per second. And as soon as I added reject, uh, regular expressions, yeah. then, then it just, yeah, that was a problem. I had to find some, some other solution. I can talk with you afterwards. Yeah, if yeah. you have some other way, it, we just like the flexibility of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, like I say, it can become a bottleneck if your performance, uh, especially if it's all routing through one server. Um, yeah, but you need to take care of this in your design. Mm -hmm. It's not the deficiency of your system, it's a deficiency of specific design that would lead to a bottleneck. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sort of along those lines, how many um, uh, discrete, so it's a system that would be routing through you know, a handful of, of, of message files, which gives you essentially a star configuration for your mm -hmm. How many? How many of these uh, subscribers have in a, in a typical system for us? In a typical execution, were dozens, <coughs> or so. So most likely, we're gonna uh, spawn one for the execution uh, at the initialization time, and then keep it alive when the initialization finishes. And then later, when any parallel test coming in, uh, we just spawn one and then um, goes away. No. Oh. He, well, but he was also, I think Ellen was also talking how many things that we had all connected in at one time. And uh, so, um, oh, so, the so, you fire, so you fire, so you launch a test as a subscriber of the test bus and then it goes away. Yes. Okay. However, the UI is made up of a whole bunch of individual tasks. Those are all connected in. Yeah. 
So as you, yeah, as you can see, all these the list of uh, these names in the system hierarchy, they are all. Um, Those are all processes connected into our. Yeah, so, so basically, another view is that when you see this tree control, it's not only a tree control. It's a tree control on the separate processes that does the update to the tree control. So it has its own message queue handler. And it's just using the uh, technique that inserts it into the sub panel. And then the maximum level depth of the uh, sample, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, sub panel insertion is five. So we have basically sub VI insert into the sub panel in alpha sub VI and then in, and then that piece of sub VI insert into another sub panel alpha sub VI and then like all the insertions and the deep of uh, the depth maximum now in my system goes up to five. I assume they can go more. Yeah. And, and because every, everything is like parallel, they don't know each other most likely uh, so they're like communicating with this kind of messaging system. I'm yeah, comparing this, you know, we've got, you know, sounds like you might have a couple of dozen peers, essentially, all pretty much in Well, uh, and that new process list, I don't know, I mean, could it look like was in there, in the task manager. But, yeah, so this, that's all the current active processes subscribed in with the uh, broker right now. See if I close this one, it will go away. So I, we haven't counted, but we haven't seen so a yeah, threshold yet. With that execution, well, I, 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 I'm not concerned about threshold. It's a lot of, it, it's a lot of potential messaging problems. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, but you manage, but you actually manage your message about it. Okay, so so if, if you're designing something in this, in this framework, you would sit down and say, I'm going to have these major components. Here are the message routes between them, and that's well defined and understood. Yes. Yeah. So, so, which would let you do something like say, I'm going to have a subsystem of components that really just talk to each other. Yes. Then expose. And then one of them exposes some routes. To yes. The so that would be how you do a subsystem. That was that was where I was going. Okay. With that. Yeah. It's how you have a subsystem of <coughs> things that talk to each other. And you made multiples of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the purposes I'm showing with the group message is that the subsystem can subscribe to one group yeah. that everyone will only listen to the message type it puts in into the enum and then subscribe to that group ID so that everything you post or well, that message you post on that group ID, uh, the subscribers in that group will, will receive. Can and that message do not go to the other groups or outside. Can you block others from subscribing to a group? Can once you, once you, you, sub do you once have you a restricted group? Yeah. We, we don't have that right now. Okay. We haven't had a need for it. Uh, there's nothing. Well, you're, you're doing it administratively. You know yeah. not to talk to those people. Yeah. As opposed to yeah, it's just security by obscurity. Uh, Don't yeah. tell the topic name. Yeah, yeah it's it's you're, you have instead of administrative, which is the the, the paper design of your system. We're just not going to do this with mm -hmm. the not. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah. if ever, as long as you have that written down somewhere, is fine. But if somebody coming in, going, oh, I I can just talk to that guy. Yeah. Which might cause you some trouble. Yeah, essentially you could using uh, the um, backdoor we created. Yeah. That you, if you know the identity of that group or that uh, listener, definitely you can talk to it. Like here, if you click on, uh, and that like that yeah, can cross that. I can, yeah, I can, yeah, I can, yeah, I can yeah, enter yeah. one message. It's only one message to that group. Say, hey, go away. That's yeah. some kind kind of backdoor you, you still can create, but doesn't mean uh, you you want to break it. Yeah. yeah. And, and in our construct, we haven't come across the need for like highly secure, you know, lockdown of the messages and things like that. But well, that's it's mostly about. I mean, it's not so much protecting against malice; it's protecting against uh, erroneous. What's it? What's it behind? It's maintaining the boundaries of subsystems. Yeah, yeah. Which is which is about you know you know protecting protecting one from oneself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to protecting from from a malicious uh -huh. party. Yeah. Have you pushed any high speed data through this? Um, no, because our printers aren't exactly high speed. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, we're not testing hardware, we're testing the printer. And the bottleneck in our test system is the speed of the printer. 
Um, you know, when we're sending down labels that, that most of that count that I said earlier, that our test points, that's 250,000 labels that we use in a, in a test system that, that we have. Um, and it just, that takes time, you know, because the printer's just not that fast. Are you publishing any of these? The network queue, yes. Um, I'd have to probably go talk to our legal department about what else I would be able to publish. Um, it was on lava, but we modified it. So I am going to put push that out. We were gonna, probably going to try and build a package and put it in a tools network, um, but we'll put a copy with uh, the presentation in the meantime until we can get up there. Um, that was publicly available. I got it from there, but we further extended it. So I'll post this version. Like I said, the rest of it, there's no company IP in here where I'm giving away company secrets, however, you know, they do own what I create or what we create, so. <laughs> and we're not a software provider, um, so it, it just would have to be going through there about what I can publish or not. Okay. That'll, yep. that'll be a fun road for you. Yeah, I, I basically have talked a few times to them and they're like, as long as there's nothing and if it's you know our company and it's got all the disclaimers that we don't support it, you know all those kind of things. Yeah. So I think they'd be open they're, to it. They're like they're they're publicly available licenses. That they yeah, that. yeah. Uh, you never mentioned a word actor. No. Is there a reason for that? <laughs> this this kind of framework started before actor framework really started being talked about, and oh. so oh so. I set up a trap. Yeah. <laughs> so you proved me that, and I, with an actor framework, hijacked the word actor. We did not hijack it. <laughs> well, you proved it otherwise. We did, not, we, did, we did not hijack it. We brought the terminology into the um, into the lab view space. I have never, ever heard any employee of NI discourage somebody from describing their systems as actors. And in fact, I, when I am presenting on Actor Framework, I will say that I was writing actors before I came to NI, before yeah. it was a thing. Before there were before there were classes in lab, you was writing yeah, actors. Yeah. Right? I'm not saying <laughs> this is bad or good, I'm saying there's the perception out in the wild. No, and I, and, and, and that's, and that's, yes. And, and, and I personally work to, no, I, I, I am thrilled when I hear somebody talking about their non-AF system as actors because it means we've got the idea out there. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing that should, that, that's the most important thing I think Actor Framework did was to get people thinking about our parallel systems uh, in this I way. I completely agree with you. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the actor messaging terminology was defined by Professor Muir from Carleton University back in the 1990s. No, Carl Hewitt, no, no, no. 1973 MIT. Carl, oh, okay. <laughs> Carl Hewitt <laughs> and Professor Hewitt, Hewitt, Hewitt of MIT. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's like the fifth or sixth slide in my course. <laughs> 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 